Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. The Bible says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. He being dead, yet speaketh. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and I pray, dear God, that you would take and you'd set me aside for a few minutes, that you'd fill me full of your spirit, give me the strength and power that I need to be able to preach this morning, dear Lord. We just pray that you would take this, your message, and touch hearts and lives, dear God. May we draw closer unto you because of it. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Christ's name we pray. And amen. amen. I mentioned last week, and mentioned many times, that Hebrews 11 is often called uh, the Hall of Faith. Some people even call it the Hall of Fame of Faith. Because of the people that are mentioned within it. We looked last week and we seen that faith was defined, that it's not a, a blind faith. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen in verse number 1. We, we looked at what faith and everything was, but this morning I, I want us to look at and think about Abel's last sermon. Abel's last sermon. Now, this morning we're going to be laying groundwork probably for tonight's message, unless I just get a rolling and listen, if I get steamrolling, I've got ten pages. Yeah. That's why I say you need to be back tonight to catch the last half. Amen. But within Hebrews 11, we see that faith was declared in verse 1, and then, or defined in verse 1, and then faith is declared in the rest of the chapter. God takes ample time to show us the Old Testament saints lived by faith Amen. and gives us examples again and again of people living by faith. But what I want us to think about here this morning is in verse 4 it says, He being dead, yet speaketh. In other words, he continues to speak to our heart through his life. You know, each and every one of us, when we get down to the end of our life, our life may or may not continue to speak. It depends on how we live our life. And listen, sometimes it will speak in a wrong way. What kind of testimony do you want to live behind? I can't remember if it was me that I think I preached a message on this or, or I heard someone preach it, is what will your dash be? You know, when you look at a headstone, you have the date of your birth, and then you have a dash. That dash is what continues to speak, and that's what's continuing to speak about Abel's life. This morning what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Genesis 2 through 4 and look at this man named Abel and the faith that brought him to salvation and listen, also the faith that brought him to immortality in Hebrews 11. Today, 6,000 years later, we're still talking about it. And as long as the Lord tarries, people are still going to talk about him Amen. because of his life. Amen. Listen, we still talk about Charles Spurgeon, even though he had some things wrong in his doctrine because of his life. 
what he stood for. We still talk about D.L. Moody and Charles Finney and Charles Wesley because of things that they stood for in their life. We still talk, of course, about the Apostle Paul and Peter, John. We still talk about many of the people listed in Hebrews chapter 11 because of their life. Hey, we still talk about Rahab the heart, the Samaritan woman, because of things in their life. Now Genesis, when we look at Genesis, it means literally the beginning. That's why they call it the book of beginnings. But it's the seedbed of the Bible, if you will. You find a lot of laws of first mention in Genesis that even as Christians we should live by today. I'm not saying you have to live by them to be saved, but as a Christian there's things in there you ought to live by because you name the name of Christ. And so... What I, we're going to look at this morning is seven principles that I believe Abel was taught. And then we're going to look at Abel, Abel's life tonight and take it all together and we can see his last sermon. Now the first principle I want us to think about we find in Genesis chapter number 2. Verses 16 and 17. It's the principle of obedience. The Bible says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. Or freely eat. But of the tree of the but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God gave a command to Adam to abstain from eating of one certain tree in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> Only one of the many trees that were there. Now we could, we could sit and we could look back to ourselves and think about it and say, well, man, think about all the other trees that was there. He could have ate of it and had the pleasure of eating of it. How hard is it just to ignore one thing? It's hard. Listen, the Bible teaches us that there's things in our life that we need to avoid. The Bible says that we're to abstain from the appearance of evil. The Bible says, touch not the unclean thing. The Bible gives us many commands, and, and even as Christians, we falter at those commands all the time. That doesn't make it right. But there's many things that God does not put restrictions on us, and you know, we don't even do those. There's, I don't know, there's something inherent in man that wants to go against the stream. Do you know that cats don't like to be stroked backwards? <laughs> Have you ever tried that? Stroking a cat backwards? It doesn't like it. I can remember a preacher making a comment one time, I think, <coughs> The comment was uh, made to Billy Sunday. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was to Billy Sunday. Someone said, Billy, you're petting that cat backwards. And he said, bless God, turn the cat around then. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what a lot of churches do? They come to the preacher. They're basically saying, preacher, you're petting the cat backwards. You need to turn it Turn your emotion around. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Instead of the people trying to get things right, 
and turning themselves around right. to where they're getting stroked in the right direction. They try to tell the preacher, you need to change what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the way. You don't tell God, God, listen. Turn or change the way that you're stroking me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of turning around the other way. Yeah. There's this principle of obedience. Man, you think about that. Adam and Eve had to run of the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in the city, there's a lot of things places you can go. There's a lot of things in this world that you can do. Why do we always run to the things that we're told not to do? It's that spirit of disobedience. Then we see uh, the principle of disobedience in consequences. Verse 17, it says, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Listen, before sin was ever in the world, God pronounced judgment on sin. He pronounced judgment on sin. He said, You, you disobey me. This is your penalty. For the wages of sin is death. From 6.3 tells us. In this world, listen, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, the very next chapter, that there's consequences, chastening for the child of God. We know, as a child of God, if we get disobedient, God's going to correct us. But yet we still continue to need to be corrected. We see this principle in the Bible. The principle of man's inability to cover his sinfulness. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible said the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Immediately after sin, something changes in you. Listen, when you sin, there ought to be some type of conviction there. Immediately when they sinned in the garden, they realized that they was naked and they was trying to do something to cover it. What do we do? We, we try to hide it. We try to lie about it. We try to cover up what we do. We, a lot of times we try to explain our sin away. Make excuses for it. We see this principle. And the fact that man's way of trying to do it doesn't cover sin. Listen, they knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. You know what's wrong with Christians today? They're not ashamed when they sin. Why? Because they continue to do it. When the Bible talks about us sinning not in 1 John, it's not talking about that you will never sin. It's talking about that you will not continue in sin or continue in, to live in that same sin. Mm -hmm. But sadly enough, that's what's happening today. So immediately when they were ashamed, they, they tried to cover it. I, I like what the Bible says. Well, listen, the Bible says it for a reason. The Bible says they try to make them aprons. Well, listen, aprons don't cover much. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you know what? In the world we live in today, most people, and sadly enough, a lot of people that call themselves Christian goes out in public with not enough cover. Yeah. They go out exposing their nakedness. Mm -hmm. I'm not preaching on that, although I could. The Bible talks about that. You see, even with what they tried to do, they couldn't cover their nakedness. It was still showing. Nothing, that's the same thing. Nothing humanly can be done to cover sin. Right. You can't do anything of your own to cover <coughs> sin. Christ is the only one who can cover sin. Just like as God was the only one who covered their sin. The principle of initiation of salvation is by God. The Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. In the New Testament. In chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 8 and 9, we see the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the, garden, in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. By the way, if they had covered their sin good enough, they wouldn't have been hiding. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? How many times has God got to say to you, Where art thou? What are you doing? That's what he was saying by, Where art thou? Because usually when God comes to the garden, they met him. But now they're hiding themselves. And in our language today, where art thou? Is hey, what are you doing? Too many times in Christians' lives, when God calls out, we're hiding in the bushes. But God is initiating this thing. You notice they didn't say. When God came into the garden, they didn't say, God, we messed up. Help us. They didn't say that. No. They were running and hiding. God said, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? What, what have you done? Is the thought behind this. What are you doing? A lot of times God has to do that in our life. What are you doing? We get out and do, involved in something that we shouldn't be or at a place that we shouldn't be in our Christian life as a Christian. The Holy Spirit of God ought to be sitting there saying to you, what are you doing here? This is not the place a Christian ought to be. This is not something the Christian ought to be listening to or watching. This is not something you should be doing. How often does God got to do? How often does God got to do that time and time again over the same sin? We see the principle of initiation and salvation by God, but also the principle of sacrifice. The principle of sacrifice in verse number twenty-one of. Genesis 3. The Bible says that unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. He made coats of skins. Well, if they were coats of skins, those skins had to come from something. That's common sense. Most people don't think about that. Something had to give its life and blood to cover their sins. We see the principle of the sacrifice. None of the blood that was shed was innocent blood. 
No matter what animal it was, that animal hadn't did anything to deserve to die. But blood had to be shed. Remember what the Bible, he which knew no sin was made sin for us that we might have the righteousness of God in him. The same principle is shown here in this sacrifice. Notice also, God did not make skin aprons. He made covers. And depicts a full covering. Especially when you think about the time. Okay? Their definition of a coat then is not our definition of a coat now. Sarah's, you got your green coat? Her green coat would be the definition of their coat then, minus, probably minus the hood. They may have had the hood made on them, I don't know. I doubt it. Because then it wasn't cold. It was, uh, I believe it was pretty well even temperature all year round. Because remember, it hadn't started raining yet. It hadn't started snowing yet. None of that stuff had ever happened. But the Bible says they made them coats. You see, they tried to co cover the necessities. You, you look back at, and I don't know how the, the Micmacs dress, uh, but you see a lot of depictions and, and pictures of stuff from the Old West of the Indians running around in a loincloth. That might have been what their apron was. No, these were coats. A full body covering. Then we see the principle of the coming Messiah. Although Adam and Eve did not know the word Messiah. I believe they understood it in, in chapter 3 and verse number 15. The Bible says, I will put enmity between the woman and between thy seed. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We see in this the serpent would bruise the heel or wound the heel of this Messiah. And this Messiah, or seed as it's mentioned, would bruise the head or deal a death blow to the serpent or seed. Mm -hmm. This seed was something that was to come. The principle of the Messiah is mentioned here. Then, the principle of punishment. In verses 14 through 19, the Bible says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shalt thou go in the dust and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shalt be to thy husband, 
and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and thou hast eaten the tree of which I commanded thee, thou shalt say, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. For thou, or for dust thou art, and of the dust thou shalt return. Also in verse 23, he says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden till the ground, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. We see Satan. God pronounced to him he was going to eat the dust of the earth. The only curse not removed in the millennium. Eve, he tells, the pain of childbearing and submission to the authority of Adam. Adam had, or Eve had sidestepped the authority of Adam when beguiled by the servant. She ignored what Adam had told her. I have no doubt. You see, if, if Adam wouldn't have told her about it, remember, when you go back and you read chapter 2, Adam is told, and then it says that God put a deep sleep on Adam and created a woman. Adam was told first. If God, or if Adam would have never told Eve, then God could have not held her accountable. Because she wouldn't have known. But she was told. So God held her accountable. And then to Adam, he said the curse of man was hard labor. Earning his bread by the sweat of his brow. It was the work before everything was just there. Man, you get up in the morning, you don't have to go out and work and earn money to be able to go to the store and buy food to put on your table to cook and eat. It was already there. By the way, they, they probably didn't cook and eat. They just ate everything raw. Just pulled off the fruit or off the tree. I don't know. They might have had them sweet old good cooked apples back in those days. <laughs> I like those things. We don't know all that. But we'll, we'll know that if it's pertinent in heaven. My point is, they didn't have to plant it. They didn't have to water and fertilize it. It was done. It was there. And the ground produced bountifully. But the Bible says now the ground is going to produce thorns and thistles. Everybody asked, listen, when I was in the military, we had to do uh, combat training. And in our training, we had to do what was called escape and evasion. And me and this uh, Air National Guard fellow I was with, we had boundaries we wasn't allowed to go out of it. And we made this decision. We was going to go all the way over to our right to the creek line and then go down the creek line to try to get back to where we were supposed to. <coughs> but in order to get to that creek line, <coughs> there was a field of briars. This about this high that we had to run through. And we ran through it 
because we knew the, the aggressors wouldn't follow us. It wasn't wartime. They wasn't looking to go through something to tear their legs up. I mean, it tore my legs all to pieces. But you know, I wasn't stopping and praising God for thorns and thistles that time. <laughs> that hurt. Yes. Let, let me explain how bad it was to you this way. It ruined my pants. It tore them so bad when I was running through. And, and we're not, we're talking heavy. It, it was like tearing up a set of jeans. They were heavy. They weren't like that. People look at this world and they, they look and say, why not do that? It was part of the punishment for sin. <coughs> the reason we have it. We see the principle of this. And then for mankind, listen, you, you always hear about people that are they're wanting to have a community of utopia. Mm -hmm. And you don't have everything just pleasant. Kind of, you know, sin took that away from me. Yeah. The Garden of Eden. It was man was kicked out of it. The utopia was there. Man, you didn't have to worry about sicknesses and diseases. You didn't have to worry about working for your food. You didn't have to worry about sin or someone trying to steal you or rob you or, or do anything to you. <coughs> it was utopia. The man was kicked out by that. In the Bible we see In Hebrews 11, 4, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. The Bible says Abel's sacrifice was more excellent. Than Cain's. It wasn't because of the sacrifice, it was because of the faith in that sacrifice. Amen. The Bible says, mm -hmm. for without faith it is impossible to please God. That's right. He by faith said, This is what God <coughs> wants me to do. And I'm going to do it trusting that God will keep his end. If I exercise my faith. See, Cain didn't do that. He said, No, I think my way is better. Mm -hmm. I think my way is just as good. Cain did not do it by faith in God, he did it by faith in his own self, in his own works, that his works would be judged worthy. We see that Abel has his salvation because the Bible says he was righteous. The Bible says he was righteous. There's no doubt about there. There's no getting around it. It says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. It wasn't that his offering, listen, it's about being right with God. Because in Isaiah and Jeremiah, we find that the children of Israel are giving sacrifices. But they wasn't right with God. It wasn't done by faith. It was just done. And in those books, we see that God rejected what they did. It's because of faith that Abel had. That's why the Bible says, and, or by faith, Abel offered. It was by faith. It wasn't, hey, look what I did. Look at my lamb. 
Look at what I had grown, how my flocks had developed. It wasn't like that. There's people that come into a church and say, hey, look at my offering today. They don't do that out loud, but they give proudfully. Why? Because they're giving out of their abundance or what they want. When you do it God's way, you have to do it by faith. By faith. Able suffering. In verse number 4 of Hebrews 11, it says, He being dead. He suffered for his stand for God. Because he did the right thing, because he was living for God. He suffered because of it. Listen, the Bible tells us that we will suffer for Christ. We will go through trials and tribulations. This is nothing new. This happened from the very beginning. The world doesn't like people living for God. Because it shows their own sinfulness. Take a stand for God. Live for God. Do what's right in the eyes of God. And then Abel's servant, he gets speaking. When we look back in Genesis chapter 1 through, or 4, 1 through 13, we find the birth of two sons. We find the law first mentioned. Listen, this, this is the first mention of an offering being given to God. We see that Cain was a tiller of the ground and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Notice Verse 3, it says, And in the process of time, listen, that's a little bit different than just simply the passing of time. But it was a process. A development during that time period. You know what I think? There, there's sometimes we have to read between the lines a little bit in the Bible. We've already did that this morning. You may not have realized it. You know, when the Bible says he made coats of skins, you had to read between the lines to realize something was off. Something gave his life, right? That's just common sense. But, when we look at this, the process of time, I believe the process it's talking about, the process of time of Adam and Eve teaching Cain and Abel. Because I believe this is the first offering they gave. You see, somewhere along the line, all those things, those seven things we looked at, I believe Adam taught his children. This is what you shouldn't do. This is what you should do. This is the kind of offering. This is what God offered it for us. Even though we had to read between the lines to see the offering, this is the first offering that is spelled out. And God had to do something in their lives through Adam. They were taught those seven principles. And we see this conjunction that God 
uses and. Notice, the, it's also used in verse 1, and Adam knew his wife. Verse 2, and she again bare another. And in the process of time, We have this continual plot God is revealing to us here. It was a work in process, a continuation. We see in the Garden of Eden that there was an animal killed. We know from what the Bible teaches, God did not lead them to their own devices. He spelled some things out from the beginning. Don't touch it. If you do, this is what happens. Everything was laid out. I believe Adam told Cain and Abel those things, but then he told them, listen, we, we did go against God. This is what happens. We no longer had that sweet communion that we once had. We no longer lived in that utopia. We no longer, the earth no longer yielded its fruit to us. We, now we've got to work for it. There's something between us and God now. There's something between you and God and you need to make that thing right. We, we can see those things and, and I can sit back in my mind's eye and know without a doubt that He had to teach us. Why? Because He could not have done what He done. In chapter 4, unless they knew. They knew. Cain and Abel are now grown men. They were farming and herding. And as the process of time went on, Cain, something began to change. In his thinking, he began to develop his own, if you will, theology. Instead of doing the things that he was taught, he decided to do some things his way. He decided to do them his way. And it got him in trouble. You know, today, that same thing is going on in the world today. The Bible says in Romans 10, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Cain never submitted himself to the righteousness of God. He never offered that sacrifice that was needed. It was all about doing things his way. There are two kinds of worship we see here in Genesis. We find two different genealogies the lineage of Cain is found at the end of chapter 4. And that lineage established Cain worship. That's an ungodly line found in Genesis 6. Then the Bible talks about Adam knew his wife again and had a a child by the name of Seth. And Seth, no doubt, was taught the same things, but he established a godly line. This lineage is found in chapter 5. And by the way, these are the sons of God in 
chapter 6. The godly line of Seth. It's the sons of God are not demons that come down and procreate with the daughters of men. It was of the line of Seth. In chapter 6 and follow, we find the judgment of God upon the world of sin. You know, in the day and age that we live, you find in the Bible that the Bible talks about Cain's worship. They're gone under the way of Cain. That's not a positive thing. We need to be able to, if you remember from last week, Take the ensample. That's what we're looking at. The ensample. Later mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Remember right, 10th level. The ensample. It applies some things to our life. As I said before we start service. I want you to plan on being out tonight because we're going to be looking at Abel's sacrifice, his message, and his yet speak tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what it does in our life. I pray, dear God, that you would help us take it, apply some things to our life, realize everything was started in the Garden of Eden. We can see how it does in our life. We can look back and see that this is not a new thing, but it's been going on since the very beginning. Help us to examine our own lives. Look at our own dash. And realize, does my life yet speak of, will my life yet speak of that from God? And dear God, may your name be honored for what I put on. What's in Christ's name? Sarah's going to play him an invitation. Listen, if you're here, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how God may be speaking to your heart this morning. Maybe he's talking to you about your dash. And you need to come and talk to God.